This is Designing the Revolution. You're listening to Chapter 22, The Conservative Dilemma. OK, first of all, just to let you know, I've still got a broken leg. That's why I'm in bed, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. Uh, so we'll be doing these uh, episodes from my bed, I think, for the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully it won't last forever. Um, Yes, so we're on to the second section of this podcast. Um, up to this point, we've been looking at the macro elements, the small scale elements of organisation, meetings, um, organising campaigns and such like. And obviously, lots of people have been waiting for this big move to the actual main show, as you might, you might put it the revolution itself, the taking control of the state, we might call the macro, the large scale strategy. Um, and it probably would be right to say that people listening or watching to this have a certain involuntary um, hesitancy about looking at this subject because for the last few decades, we've been saturated with a story that goes, we cannot fundamentally change our society. We can't take control of the state. We can't change the regime. Revolutions are just romantic daydreams and such like. And this has been the prevalent uh, narrative uh, in the left, in progressive circles, in at least in Western societies. And we can see why that's the case, because for a long time this was objectively the, uh, the situation. After 1989, the whole idea of having big schemes to change society went out of fashion and everything became very reformist. Uh, argu arguably that was an objective situation in the 1990s. Into the 2000s, we discussed this quite a lot that because of the climate catastrophe and all the locked in horrors that are coming down the line, we are in a fundamentally different state. However, um, as I've talked about a few times, this is phenomenon of a cultural lag where people still believe they're living, you know, 10, 20 years behind the times. Another phrase here is left defeatism, this notion that the left can never actually win can't actually become hegemonic, i.e. really powerful. And that's connected with this, uh, this uh, notion of Tina, there is no alternative and such like. There's no chance and blah, 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 right? So as we enter the, into these episodes, I want to throw out a few provocations in this initial uh, chapter of this, this section of the podcast. So I'm calling it the conservative dilemma. And what I'm going to propose is actually the complete opposite. <laughs> that that um, the conservative domination of the state, the conservative regime, is hopelessly uh, vulnerable to revolutionary episodes. And there's massive historical support for such a position, as I'll mention in the in, in, in next uh, half hour. Um, so this... This is the opposite to this rather self-serving, you know, irrational ideology of defeat. And I'm calling it an ideology because it tends not to be open to historical analysis, sociological analysis. It looks at, you know, it cherry picks the last 20, 30 years and says that's that's what history is like, which is obviously nonsense. In other words, it's ahistorical, just thinks this is the state of play. The hegemony of the neoliberal system is endless. It's always going to be here. The most we can do is complain about it, you know, maybe get into government with some hopeless social democratic programme and tough shit, basically. <laughs> you know, that's it. All bollocks. OK, so, so this is like to try and cheer you up, at least create some fluidity in your minds of going, actually, maybe there's more to this historical you know, process of change than meets the eye. Um, so as, as I say, 
my broad proposition, provocation, as it were, in this in this chapter is say, conservatives historically are in an impossible situation. And there's three interlocking elements to this idea. So the first element is that conservatives over the last 250 years have been in this double bind. And the double bind goes as follows, that if they if they become liberal conservatives, i.e., you know, they want to promote progress and reform and move with the times, that process of opening up encourages the, the flowering of all sorts of different sorts of radicalism, revolutionary activity. So by trying to be decent guys, you know, liberal conservatives, as you might say, they actually undermine their position because lots of people are able to get going. There's free speech, freedom of assembly, uh, people can organise in the factories. So they're obviously shooting themselves in the foot if they do that. So that's one side of the bind. The other side of the bind is, OK, so the proper reactionary conservative side, you know, that's nonsense. What we've got to do is is stop the, stop progress and repress them and put people into prison and ban demonstrations. And then what that does is it has the same effect, which is it infuriates people because they're losing their rights, they're being repressed, people getting shot, put into prison, people going, this is violating my values and such like. And so they're even more mad with the regime. So the idea is, uh, is that whatever the conservative regime does, it's, it's, in, it's going to fail. Or at least there's a high probability of failure, whatever it does. So it's not some monolithic barrier, right? It's it's more like playing a game of dice. And I've used this analogy before, you know, if if you if you you know if you do one one uh, strategy, you shake a one, you lose. If you do another strategy, you shake a six, you lose. There's no strategy that actually um, removes the probability of losing power. Okay, and then a second element, which we're going to talk quite a bit more about in the coming episodes, is is this notion of herding. And I've touched on this, and I think you may have seen those free, free um, uh, chapters that have been put up about how the liberal professions. Uh, undermine themselves in the present context. And one of the ideas in here is this notion of herding, that all these conservatives are in this space. And instead of thinking really intelligently about what to do about the coming collapse of their regime, they ra they'd rather just focus on the here and now, what everyone else is doing. And and if they if they jump ship, if they actually stick their head above the parapet, they know what's going to happen. They're going to lose their job. They're going to get discredited. So there's a massive um, psychological incentive to engage in collective irrational behaviour. And this is a massive problem amongst elites historically. And obviously we can see this um, um, right in front of our faces in the present moment with the climate crisis. OK, so... The third, uh, the third element here, and I've spoken about this before, is this notion of the inevitability of regime collapse. Now, it's important to say that this is not this sort of old-fashioned Marxist determinism where, you know, the law of history determines capitalism is going to collapse and this sort of vulgar uh, historical inevitability sort of narrative, which obviously has been discredited, you know, many times because... Is far too simplistic. It's a more nuanced determinism which says that if a conservative regime uh, gets to a certain point of dysfunctionality and irrationality, then it will inevitably collapse. In other words, whatever they do in terms of, of you know, reform or repression, they're just on a death spiral and the, the regime is going to come apart. And usually this is is because of a debt cycle. So if you look historically, this is probably the most 
common reason why regimes collapse is because they get into debt. So, for instance, in, before the French Revolution, I think there was a big war with the British. There was a big war with the British. And it put enormous strain on the finances of the French state. And, you know, there was corruption and denial and all the rest of it. And uh, according to some accounts, you know, they they kept changing finance ministers. And finally, this finance minister realised that the inevitable was going to happen. And he came to the French king and said, basically, that the, the regime's going to go bankrupt in six weeks, in six weeks. So, again, you can sense, you know, a 2008 sort of comparison here, as you might say. So this this happens over and over again in history, is regimes that become stupid and they in, are in this double bind and they get into this, like, end game scenario. All right, so, you know, that's the general theory. So you can see how that theory is completely different to the left defeatism monolith theory, you know, that the state's there, the neoliberal regime is there, and it's just a big solid wall. No, 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 right? It's continually renegotiating with itself. It's continually, like, getting itself full of contradictions. And before long, it gets into this double bind and it's on its death spiral. And that's objectively where we are in 2023. Well, let's, you know, let's look at the, some of the classical examples of this, just so you don't think I'm just making all this up. So... The classic example of this, or a classic example of this, is in Russia in the 19th century. So there was this Tsar, sorry, I can't remember all these names of these people. But <laughs> anyway, there was this Tsar in the mid-19th century. He was a liberal, he was going, you know, the peasants in Russia, you know, the poor people have had a terrible time. We need to move with the times, we need to reform. So he removed serfdom. So people weren't effectively slaves on the estates and they could do various things. And it was a massive, it was a massive change and it was a massive liberal reform. <laughs> and then, you know, you have to sort of half laugh, laugh about it, I suppose, is, is because he opened things up and became more liberal, then, as we said, all these revolutionaries could have more space and they weren't very keen on the Tsar. Anyway, they shot, they blew him up. I don't know, I can remember where they shot him. Anyway, they killed him. Which was obviously a bit of a downer because he was trying to be a good guy. Um, anyway, you can see what happened next. You know, that was the liberal, the liberal conservative phase. After that, of course, all the conservatives came in and said, that's terrible. You know, last thing we want to do is open up. You know, if you open up, all that happens is, is you get these revolutionaries and they start shooting us. You know, how ungrateful we need to show that we're strong and, and we need to repress people and put them in prison and hang them and all the rest of it. So from, you know, from the 1870s, I think, more or less until 1905, so you had this new paradigm of conservatives, which proves, as, as the theory predicts, proves to be just as stupidly rational, because obviously, once you do this level of repression, and by this time you've got industrialization happening, and these appalling conditions, and things are getting out of date, and the Russian state goes to war with the Japanese, and it just is a total disaster. So then you get this massive rejection of this um, repressive strategy, and you have the 1905 revolution. So that's not good either. So you can see whatever the Conservatives do in this particular historical context, they're pretty much buggered, right? You know, it's like there's no solution other than, of course, actually removing the whole regime itself, which by definition, conservatives are not going to do. So there's a little sort of side plot on this, which is the pretense strategy. So we're going to talk about this, you know, in the modern context in a minute, of course. But so in, you know, Russia was pretty dumb in some ways. You know, it just had this really binary reform versus reaction uh, dichotomy. In more sophisticated states like Austria-Hungary Austria and Germany in the 19th century, they had this thing called neo, uh, neo-autocracy. So the conservative regime was going, well, we'll, we'll give these um, concessions, you know, to the liberal revolutionaries and what have you, and we're going to have a parliament and we're going to have, you know, prime ministers. But it was all uh, the equivalent of greenwashing, sort of autocracy washing, as you might say. So it, 
it, at the end of the day, the 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 emperor still had total control. Uh, but it was successful to a certain extent in so much as it duped people. But as we all know, people, you know, over the medium term, people understand what's going on. And when the First World War happened, you know, the whole corruption and, you know, dead hierarchy and all the rest of the rubbish that autocracy had created over the previous half century came out. And, and as you probably know, uh, both Germany and Austria-Hungary lost the war and those big, big claps of the autocracy situation and democracy came in. Um, so, so much for the pretense scenario, as you might say. All right, so uh, a, a last comment on this, just in case you're still f thinking there's some sort of right way, right strategy for conservatives, is is people, you know, people in the present moment you know m many of you watching this you probably inherited this idea that the reactionary conservatives are the real real bad guys and the liberal conservatives are you know they're still bad guys but they're you know, not so bad mm, historically there's very little support for that in the sense that and i'll give you an example so just before the first world war in russia the people who wanted the war the most were the liberal conservatives because the liberal conservatives were like precursors, you might say, to the neoliberal elites today. In other words, they were aggressive, expansionist, they wanted industrialization, they were imperialistic, they were gun ho, they were going, you know, Russia's great, we're going to expand, we're going to go to war with Germany, it's going to be glorious, all this sort of thing. These were liberals, in inverted commas, right, in a Russian context. While the reactionary conservatives, you know, interestingly enough, were going, well, hang on a minute, you know, war's scary, it's going to, you know, it's going to open up all the revolutionary uh, narratives and, and, you know, it's an unknown and we want to stay with good old-fashioned Russia, we don't want to be going on foreign adventures. In other words, there's no, historically, there's no necessary relationship between imperialistic stupidity, as you might say, and the degree of conservatism. And you can see echoes of this in the sort of conservative small England, small England sort of tradition in, in the UK, which is we don't want to go and have empires, we just want to stick it with our good old fashioned, you know, native English uh, conservative hierarchy sort of logic. Um, so I'm not necessarily making any, you know, big moral judgments here. I'm just giving some broader historical analysis that that history is not as clear as the ideologies the ideology of left defeatism would have us believe. All right. So what I want to suggest is that in terms of cheering ourselves up, you might say, well, Roger, that's, you know, history. What about today? So I want to try and cheer you up <laughs> in terms of the prospect for fundamental uh, regimes change and social transformation over the next five to ten years, which is obviously the main proposition of these of these talks. So the thing about history is, uh, you know, it tends tend to get pushed into two camps. You know, history is irrelevant; it's all about today, or you know, history repeats itself and has this regular pattern. So we want to we want to engage in something a little bit more sophisticated with that, which is which is history provides rhythms, it provides patterns, but those rhythms and patterns never exactly replicate, obviously, right? Because every historical period has its certain elements of uniqueness. And at the same time, you see echoes of the past, or even more than echoes of the past, you can see these similar patterns uh, forming. So let's look at some echoes or some patterns. The obvious thing about the present historical moment is that the neoliberal regime has been dominant for 30 years. And this, in many ways, replicates the conservative liberal position before 1914. And lots of people have referred to this in various literatures. In other words, it's internationalist. It believes in economic growth. It believes in uh, opening up markets, uh, free trade, all this sort of thing. And it becomes massively extractive, anti-nature, exploitative and all the rest of it. And then paradoxically, 
it contradicts itself. And this is, you know, where Marxism is, is broadly correct in the sense that it creates monopolies. So it, it becomes a, a, a contradiction in terms that it doesn't actually make people richer, broadly speaking, and it doesn't free up the economy because it starts developing this, um, this closeness because the big companies swallow up the other big companies and such like. So it becomes a, a rip objectively a repressive regime, not a liberating regime, as the people who are into this ideology would uh, would would claim. So, for instance, you know, the birth, uh, the deaf, the age at which people die in the US and arguably in Britain is now declining, which isn't a great advert for the whole neoliberal project, which is supposed to be uh, taking us to the sunny uplands of prosperity and all the rest of it. So, You've got that element at the, uh, in, the, in the present historical moment. But then you've got this older, contradictory form of conservatism, which is, you might call reactionary or old-fashioned or, you know, pre-neoliberal. And that emphasises the solidity and continuity of the traditional family, the community, the nation, uh, rituals, um, focus on a sense of place, patriotism, nationalism. And you can see how that, that orientation is largely in contradiction with the neoliberal project, because the neoliberal project is what's called, you know, creative destruction. It's always moving families around, it's destroying communities, you know, it's building motorways, factories, uh, it's undermining the independence of the nation. So you can see at the heart of the Conservative project, there's this massive structural structural conflict, which doesn't really fit into a neat left-right uh, division, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So what we see here, as I've said, is this is not a static situation. The situation becomes more and more fraught. The double bind of the Conservative proposition becomes more extreme because the the promise, the dream, as it were, of the neoliberal vision becomes more and more like obviously deficient and it more and more undermines these traditional values, which is why arguably you've got this Brexit, you know, division on the right, you know, people rejecting modernity and Europe and all, all this sort of thing. So let's look at the end game scenario here. So the end game scenario is is this situation where the finance minister goes to the French king in 1789 and says, you've only get, got six weeks left. That's the moment of truth. And that's when you're in this end game situation where according to the sociology of revolution, there is a point at which a regime is definitely going to collapse. You don't know exactly when it is, but it's basically done because whatever it does within its own, within its own ideology, it's not going to uh, survive. So we can see this in the present moment with the ideology of growth. So instead of looking at a sort of left-right binary, let's look at what is the fundamental underlying uh, ideology of the carbon regime. And that's growth. And of course, growth in itself is an ideological word because the more you look at growth, it's not growth, is it? It's actually destruction of the natural environment, it's destruction of relationships, and it contradicts it. It's a contradiction in terms because it's actually destroying the economic basis of society at the moment, at the present moment. But what, what I want to draw out is within the ideology of growth, in other words, if you're within that, you've got this double bind because if you go for more growth, then you're going to destroy the economy and you're going to destroy society. You're going to have ecological 9-11s, you know, all this thing that the, that the climate scientists are, kind of, are saying. If you go for saying, well, we're not going to have economic growth, then because you're still in that paradigm, you know, like the Labour Party saying we're going to have nice green jobs and all the rest of it, then what you're, you're going to get rejected by the, by the uh, electorate because they've all bought into this ideology as well, because that's what's been churned out for 30 years. So you're going to lose elections. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, you're not going to jump ship, in other words. So whatever this regime does, it's going to collapse, because it can't reform itself without losing power, 
And if it doesn't reform itself, it's going to lose power because it's going to destroy society. Bang, bang, checkmate. That's, that's, what they, that's what it means when people say in the sociology of revolution, the end of this regime is now inevitable. That's where we're up to. Now, you know, as a little side note on here, we can put in the pretense move. The pretense move in the present context is not, you know, sham democracy like it was with the autocratic regimes in the 19th century. The sham move in the present context, which is, you know, the ideology now is not autocracy. The ideology is growth, right? So the, the growth double bind is, is hidden under greenwashing. In other words, you can have your cake and eat it. We can carry on doing capitalism and all the rest of it, uh, but we can do it in a green way, which we all increasingly know is pure bollocks. Right? It's just objectively not possible. You know, one of the most sort of extreme elements of nonsense about this is is growing trees. We can grow trees. Well, no, it's not going to work because it takes 40 years for trees to actually start taking carbon out in the atmosphere, assuming they haven't died because of neglect or corruption uh, or, or because of, um, you know, flooding and, and droughts and forest fires. So it's a dead duck, right? It's a it's a it's an abuse of public trust and this is the thing with the pretense strategy is it works well initially but then it backfires because people know you're lying when people know you're lying not only do you lose all your advantage you go into a debt because people don't even trust you anymore so it's a really stupid strategy in the medium term so as a little bit of a tangent here um, i just want to refer you back to that um to the to the um chapter I did on talking to the media and talking to the right-wing media. So the left defeatist position is we should never talk to the right-wing media. You know, you should never go on right-wing uh, chat shows because, you know, one, they're nasty and number two, you know, you're up against these ridiculous uh, arguments. <laughs> you can't win them. So that's total nonsense. Uh, as some of you know, I go on right-wing chat shows and I, I'm relaxed. Why am I relaxed? Because you're facing a bunch of arguments which are completely self-contradictory. And all I have to do is go... Well, you know, you want to have growth and that's going to lead to everything you don't want. How, how are you going to negotiate that? You know, ask the open question. And before long, they're tying themselves in knots simply because I'm just referring their own propositions to their own values and showing the contradiction between the two. All right. So hopefully I've sort of, you know, half teared you up. <laughs> in the sense that left defeatism is self-serving, it's historically illiterate, and it's just boring, right? It's like, no, we're in a new historical period. History in the longer term shows this enormous fluidity in, in history. And um, we have to overcome this impulse to continually go, oh, it won't work, it won't work. So, you might think, oh, yeah, 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 you know, I see that. But what I would warn you is this is deeply embedded in our progressive psyches. And, and I've got a friend, he was talking to me yesterday and he was saying, you know, you know, I was talking about changing, you know, taking over the British state in two years. And he was just going, there's no chance of that happening, Roger. You know, the international system is going to is going to, you know, just crush anything. And he referred to Syriza and Podemos and all these sort of half hearted efforts as you might say to create you know socialism in one country as you might say and of course the problem with this is he's just cherry picking he's just looking at the last three iterations but what history shows us is you get failure 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 and then you get a massive success just because you've had failure and failure and failure doesn't mean you're not going to get success because historical conditions fundamentally change over time and the next time you know, there's an uprising in Western democracy, you are shaking that dice. And I would say if you shake four, five or six, you're going to actually get something really amazing happening. Um, and this brings me on to the, the last point, of course, is if you're going to have a four, five, six chance, it's going to be because you've already organised for the revolution beforehand, which is what this podcast is about. So if my friend has his way, we're just not going to organise for this at all. We're just going to sit there as passive subjects and waiting for the 
you know, international economic system to collapse. And then presumably we're going to try and make something up really quickly. No, if we're going to do this successfully, we need to think constructively and intensely and collectively and creatively about how we're going to respond to this moment, whether it just comes out of the blue or we proactively create it as previously discussed in other chapters. Um, so I'm just going to leave you with the even maddest idea. <laughs> so the maddest idea is that the conservative opposition messes it up so badly that they actually ask us into power. Right? And uh, there are some, you know, historical sort of rumblings of this, you know, like during Extinction Rebellion, this, this diplomat phoned us up and pleaded with us to close down COP because he was so embarrassed and desolated by its utter contradictions. So often, often regimes become so decrepit, so hopeless, hopelessly self-contradictory within their ideology that they just completely drift away and you have this massive opening to create a progressive alternative or if you don't, obviously, you're going to open the doors to more fascistic alternatives. So we all know this is the narrative. So, yeah, that's the sort of opening gambit for me on the revolution design itself. Thanks very much.